Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can come back to your word all day, every day, and see your heart's desire on paper for us. But do we get tangled or caught up or come to a dead end, in, dead end in our lives, we can come back to your word again and again and be refreshed and recharged. Lord, I pray for what you've laid on my heart today to share. Lord, I pray it would be a blessing and an encouragement for every one of us. Amen. I want to talk about something today that's, I guess, a fairly heavy topic. That's the, the power and consequences of strong words. Um, in the heat of the moment, we can often say things or make declarations or oaths, if you like, that, that lock us into positions that restrict our choices, restrict the way we relate to God and to other people. And just to think about what we say and, and watching over our tongues. Josh, could you put up that first verse, please? I've got quite a few Bible verses today, but they're all written up here. Um, one of the people I feel most sorry for in the Bible was Jephthah. Anyone know who Jephthah is? There he is. Judges 11. I'll just read it out. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aroa to the vicinity of Minnith as far as Abel Keramim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of tambourines? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and he cried, O oh my daughter, you have made me miserable and wretched, because I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. I just think that's such a tragic story. What was the guy thinking? If any of you fathers was away for a few months, and then you come home, who would you expect to come out the door and meet you? I mean, maybe he was thinking it would be the chickens or something. I don't know, but it just seems like such a stupid thing to say. And then he must have, his heart must have just, just gone, sunk through his boots when he saw his daughter come out and he thought, oh, I've made this vow to the Lord. And he stuck to it. And she was gracious and said, you can go ahead with it. So he killed his daughter because of the stupid thing he promised. I can't really see anything meritorious in what he did myself. Um, another one, 1 Samuel 25. Now, there's three verses that are all just stuck together. They're just the key verses. I'll just, it's a little bit of an involved story, but David was hanging out in the hills and caves, fighting and skirmishing with Saul for ages. And he had a bunch of roughnecks and criminals and Anyone who had a grudge would kind of line up with David and he was, they were in his army. And there was a village, um, and the chief was Nadab, married to Abigail. And they had shepherds and, that used to wander around in the hills. And when the, these villages were up in the hills near David, David and his men kind of kept a bit of an eye on them. They didn't steal their sheep, which is what you'd expect from a bunch of hoods in the hills. They kind of kept a bit of an eye on them. Um, and and didn't do them any harm. And then David and his men had been up in the hills for ages. They were tired and sick of fighting probably. And they heard that there was shearing going on down in Nadab's village. And that's always a festival time. And so David thought, oh, so he sent a bunch of a delegation down to Nadab and said, hey, could you give us a bit of spare grub? If you've got a few sheep going loose, we'd, we'd like a good feed. And Nadab said, 
get lost, I don't know who you are, and sent them packing. And they went back to David, and David, right, strap on your swords, guys, we're going to go and get these guys. And they, they were heading down the hill towards Nadab's village, and David said, may God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him, meaning Nadab. And then he turned the corner, and Nadab's wife, Abigail, had heard what had happened, and she thought, you stupid twit of a husband. And she quickly put together a feast, packed it up on donkeys, and sent them up the hill to try and appease David. And just after he'd said this vow, he met Abigail. And she, she gives this absolutely brilliant speech where she appeals, she asks for mercy on her stupid husband and appeals to David's better side. And David actually changes his mind. And... So the next verse after David changed his mind is, uh, sorry, this is what David says to Abigail. May you, in verse 33, may you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. And so Abigail averted that disaster. She went home, told her husband what had happened and his heart turned to stone. And a week later, he just dropped dead. And when David heard of that, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong, and he has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent went to Abigail, but asking her to become his wife. He must have been oppressed with her oratory. But, <laughs> but here, Jephthah had made this rash vow, and he sacrificed his daughter. David had made this vow to kill this guy, but he, he could see that there was a better way. And he actually had the courage, wisdom, to change his mind. And to say, well, I made this rash promise to God, but the it's actually wrong, what I promised, and, and I'm just going to do the right thing, and I'll trust God to do what he has to do. And so he threw himself on God's mercy. And David did that another time. You remember when he counted all the tribes and God said, you've done really wrong here. You can have punishment A, B or C. And David said, you choose. I'll trust your mercy. And they still got punished badly, but he threw himself on God's mercy. So David had the sense to not stick to the silly promise he'd made. Um, 2 Samuel 3, 9. Now, Edna was one of David's... Um, sergeants, lieutenants, and he was keen to get, give David the ascendancy over Saul in this ongoing fight. And, and in the heat of the moment, they were having this big rah-rah political meeting, and Abner says, may God deal with Abner, be it ever so severely, if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him on oath. So again, why would you say that sort of stuff? Why would you invoke God's anger and wrath on yourself, on your behavior? It, these, these people are just, in the, for whatever reason, in the heat of the moment, in the strong emotion, they're just saying this really strong, strong stuff. An oath, a declaration, a promise, um, whatever you want to call it. And huge consequences. And it's just, yeah, why do they do that? Acts chapter 5. We all know this story really well, and I still don't really get it. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it sold... Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. And then Ananias' wife turned up a wee while later, and they said, did you sell your farm for X dollars? And she said, yes. She was probably thinking, um, I better stick up to my husband and say what we agreed to say. And then she died too. Wasn't that just a little fib? Who said 
fibs like that before. Um, but he died because th there must be more to it than meets the story. I mean, they must have made a big deal about how much they were giving or being public or something, but they were really costly words for Ananias, that little lie. He died because he pretended he was giving all the proceeds and he just kept some back for himself. So these vows and strong declarations or resolutions, they, they lock us into rigid positions and attitudes. And there's, um, there's good resolutions and bad resolutions. A few weeks ago, Rex told us that um, funny, sorry, Rex, tragic story about buying that car without even seeing it. And he said, I am never going to buy a car without seeing it first again. So this, this, this kind, of kind of thing I'm talking about, it's a, it's a resolution coming out of a bad experience and often in the heat of the moment. And sometimes those things are really good and we learn from them and we, you know, they set a good course for the future. So he won't do it again, will he? <laughs> um, and then there's, but then there's, there's bad resolutions. And it's when, when the pressure's on, um, when our defenses are up, when we're feeling really vulnerable, um, often it's based on one or a few experiences that have gone really wrong. Um, sometimes in my work I have people that really struggle to trust me. And when you dig into it, they've been, they've been let down in the past by the medical profession. And so something's gone wrong, there was an operation botched up, maybe someone died. And you know, a tragedy. And in the heat of that moment, they've, they've come to a resolution that we will never trust doctors again. And that locks them into positions and attitudes for the future that might be a real hard to get out of and might be a real problem for them. And it happens to lawyers, mechanics, um, doctors, the clergy, you know, different experiences that ha people have had and not, not going to trust them again. And so they, you can end up saying lawyers are always whatever you want to say or various racial groups are, or men are, or women are. And, and you, from a, a limited experience, you make these judgments that are really costly. Now, some people say you should never let the facts get in the way of a good story, but I do have to point out one verse that is against what I've just been saying. Titus 1 and 12. Now, I presume Cretans are people who live in Crete, even one of their own prophets has, have said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. So, so that's against what I've been saying today, where there's been a, a blanket statement made, but the Cretans must have been really bad. Before. <laughs> that's all I could say. But other than that, it's, 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 I think it's really dangerous to start making judgment blanket statements about various groups or people um, and, and then you end up being unable to trust. And if we tell ourselves something often enough, we can start believing it. If we repeatedly say you never trust doctor, you never trust, you, you never trust this person or that group, then we can start believing it and it can start poisoning our spirits. And that's especially true within the church. Um, and just, just think about it for a minute. I'm sure everyone in this room would say that they what they want to do today is to please the Lord. That we want to be available for the Holy Spirit to move in us, to change us, to transform us, that we can be more like Christ. That means we are all changing all the time, hopefully every day. So if I don't trust you because last week you did blah, 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 but you're waiting on God to change you, then I don't actually know whether you're still the same person you were last week. But I've locked you into this rigid position of untrustworthiness, so I can't trust you. But God's working on you, and God's working on me. And, I've, and yet I've, I've locked us down into this position that affects you and affects me. But God's changing us all. He, he's working on us. He's transforming us. Proverbs 13.3, please. He who guards his lips guards his life, but he who Rash words can come back to bite us. Ephesians 5 and 19, please. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and 
sing out to the Lord. So we're all the same. James 3, verse 2, please. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When, he, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Have you ever seen those great big tankers, the sea things, oil tankers? They're absolutely rugby field long. And the rudder at the back is a tiny, tiny percentage of the total size of that ship. And yet the rudder controls it. And our tongue is the rudder of a ship. And it can steer a really good course or a really bad course. And if we let our tongue go loose and just go for it, we're far more likely to pull down and cause dissension and strife and grief than we are to encourage and build up if we let our tongues just go. Matthew chapter 5, please. Again, you have heard it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So just keep it simple. Just say yes or no without all this great declaration and promises and the, these rash things that can limit us and come back to bite us. Take each day as it comes and each person as you find them. Colossians 4 and 6, it's the last verse. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. What that's saying, I guess, is cut each other some slack. Be gracious towards one another. We all make mistakes, every one of us, every day probably. The, the Holy Spirit is a wind. He's moving and blowing on each one of us and on us as a body. Who knows where we're going to end up in a few years' time. And if we've said strong words like, I can't stand alongside someone, I can't sit in the same room as someone, God might have a plan that we actually have to work with that person or that organization. And if we've made rash promises or declarations, we're locking ourselves out of future potential, future developments that the Holy Spirit brings about. So in summary, what I'm saying today is be gracious and tolerant. Don't lock out choices of ourselves or of others by loose strong words, but instead speak to encourage ourselves and others all the time. And while I've been saying this, if you've been thinking quietly, is he getting at me? Yes, I am exactly as much as I'm getting it myself. And it's something we just all need to be aware of. Let's just seek to bless each other as we speak. The Holy Spirit, Christ is alive in each and every one of us. And let's recognize that and speak to the Christ in each other and build each other up as a body. So with that in mind, let's just finish and we can have a coffee and enjoy speaking to each other, encouraging and building up, speaking in psalms and hymns and not making promises that limit our choices and come back and bite us later. Thank you, Lord, that you made each one of us. Lord, you made our tongues. Thank you for the power of speech that is so, so powerful. And Lord, I pray that Every word we speak would encourage and build up each other, ourselves, our families, the body of Christ, this community. May our words be a blessing to others. Amen.